and now natural farming classes. So uh, uh, I want to congratulate you on your excellent decision to come today. It's gonna, it's, what, what happened with natural farming for me is I found out I didn't have to go to the farm supply for anything anymore. And I was, I was uh, uh, spending, I think, you know, 500 to to $1,000 a month at the farm supply, which they liked. They liked when I walked in, they said hello. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, what, what else would you like, sir? Everything, everything's available here. You know, and I get out my credit card. And the first time I went to meet Master Cho in, uh, in Hilo to take a seminar, there was like 250 people there. And I was like, what are all these people doing there? And I realized, that, like, everybody, everybody is there not only to save money, but so that they can keep their uh, uh, purchases on island. What they're doing, they can not only, uh, they can, they can, uh, not only uh, buy it on island, but create at their own farm. So uh, all the different implements that you're going to learn today, uh, like you, there's very, very few inputs that you're going to have to, to, to buy. And you're going to be able to do this all on your own farm, and you're going to be able to what I call supercharge the growth of your plants. Cure diseases, repopulate the bacterial populations in your uh, orchards. It's all the things that you've heard about of soil health, but brought down into a tangible thing that you can actually take in your own hands and, and create soil health. And uh, uh, Drake, Drake has uh, uh, been one of my heroes in the natural farming movement. In fact, I don't know if you, you saw that, but he ran for mayor against uh, oh, Gary Kim. Yes, that's where I met him. This is the guy right here. And uh, he ran under uh, 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 the Good Microbes for All banner, right? <laughs> yes. Thank God we have someone that's watching out for the planet Earth that's running for mayor. So uh, I want to uh, uh, also kind of just familiarize you. This is Hawaiian Sanctuary. We're a nonprofit uh, farm, and uh, we have educational classes here thurs every Thursday. This is our six months class, um, and we're going to have another six months of the classes through the end of the year. And we're partially funded by the county, only 50%. So if anybody wants to leave donations, they'd like to see this more. There's a jar over here, the blue jar by Michelle. There's even $5 in there right now. That's pretty cool. <laughs> And uh, uh, I, wa I want to, l when you guys walk around the grounds here, you look at all these trees, uh, all these this orchards and all the plantings, they were all done by different teachers during permaculture classes. So we've been doing permaculture classes here for 10 years, right? So everything you see has been planted during a permaculture class by different teachers. So that's kind of cool to go walk around. We also are a cacao farm, and I'm the chocolatier. I make cacao out of the chocolate growing here on the farm. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really, I'm really excited about that. There's a cacao a chocolate available with all local organic ingredients in, in the uh, locker lounge with coffee, if anybody's interested. The bathrooms are right here in the back. Just walk straight back. Uh, uh, you'll find there's two back there. Uh, if anybody wants to, has, has a, 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 a young person, an old person, a person that wants to get into farming um, and wants to be an intern, we have an internship program here that uh, we have 10 to 15, 20 people that come and study and stay here and live here and do permaculture every day. They do yoga every day, a yoga internship. Um, we have yoga classes, I think, six days a week here and restorative yoga classes in the evening for people that, uh, you know, that really, I, th I think that the, the restorative class on Thursday actually focuses on people that have, uh, you know, um, let's see, disease, you know, things like that, um, Parkinson's and things like that. She helps people like that. It's so incredible. So if you know people like that that, that need uh, attention uh, and they'd love to come to a class, that's here. Wednesday afternoon is a great, great restorative class. Uh, <clears throat> I also want to uh, refer back to my notes here before I get too far away here. Uh, let's let's, let's uh, go ahead and talk about Drake a little bit. Drake's been to Korea five times to study with Master Cho. <laughs> Four times now, and five times coming up uh, in, uh, I guess, a couple of months. Yeah, September. Yeah, and that's just incredible to me because uh, if you want to study with uh, Master Cho, you've got to learn to speak Korean. And a lot of times it means really going to Korea and researching uh, what goes on there. And I've seen pictures of Drake at chicken farms and orchards all over Korea studying natural farming and learning from the very, very best. So that you, you, you're not just getting like somebody that's making up natural farming. There's a lot of people that do that. They can, you know, people can breed bacteria in their backyards, but there's just one natural farming, Cho natural farming uh, uh, system. And it's very, very precise. And it, it's down to like the, the centimeter and the detail. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's where this is coming from. A, sort of an ancient line of knowledge passed on through Drake here. And uh, so I want to I wanna, uh, say without further ado, let's introduce Drake Weiner. Thank you. Um, before Mary gets started, I just want to say one more thing about um, 
We're having our next Hawaii Farmers Union United, our uh, Puna chapter that just began. And if, and if you'd like to join, there's membership forms here. There's also membership uh, forms on our um, hawaiiansanctuary.com slash plantaloha webpage. And so you can go down there and download a form. Um, Drake's a member of the HFUU. They support just a lot of good things for small family farmers, including pre and natural farming. They were part of at the hemp festival that I went to recently. And um, if you join the Puna chapter, we can start supporting other things that we want here in Puna for farmers. So um, it's the, our next meeting is the first Thursday in July, it's the 6th. And so there's information up here about that. And that's all. Thank you. So aloha. So um, sorry. So um, so I'd like to start um, kind of by centering ourselves, and um, so we sing a chant it's called Eho Mai, and um, what it talks about is kind of. Uh, um, etheric knowledge and uh, knowledge from below, which in this case it's microorganisms meeting in the center and then being present here to receive the knowledge and wisdom that is all around us. So if you can all stand up. <laughs> If you want to, you can join hands with your neighbor. <coughs> join in over here. Yeah. So if you know it, please join in with me. If you don't, um, just let it enter into you. Receive the knowledge that's there. E ho mai ka ike mai luna mai e Ona mea una noia ona mele E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai E ho mai kai ke mai luna mai e coming out today. Thanks for taking an interest in agriculture. Thanks for taking an interest in the Aina. The Aina is that which feeds us. Uh, it's also commonly referred to as the land. So um, being a part, being a caretaker, that's a huge responsibility. Right? You are the chosen few. They get to share it with everyone else. So thank you. Really. Um, so so I want to start off today kind of outlining um, what I'm going to be doing here. Um, today, we get to learn about solutions. So if you got problems, we got solutions. I'm going to go kind of broad over natural farming. Um, 
keep it really simple, easy. This is a complete whole farming system. And we have six classes in this series to go through. So there will be lots more coming your way. But today we're just going to start where we can all get on the same page and understand what's being, what is the core of this system. Next class, next Thursday, we'll be learning about how to make foods. So some of the things I'm going to talk about today will actually be getting into how do I make that at home. Like Steve was talking, he wanted to stop going to the fertilizer store. So how do you start doing that? How do you turn something that you thought before was a problem into a solution? Then the next class will be getting into microbes. Microbes are the living little critters that are everywhere. They're in the soil, they're in the air, they're on your skin right now, they're in your gut. They're doing good things for us if we feed them. So that's why I start with food and then I get into microbes. Can't have a bunch of people if you don't feed them. So food, microbes, then I'll be getting into in depth into the nutrient cycle. So looking at your plants, seeing, okay, right now it's a kid. I'm gonna feed it kid food. Now it's a teenager. Feed it teenager food. Now it's giving me fruit. I'm gonna feed it fruit so that it can fruit better and be more productive for me. So each of these stages will go through. <coughs> then we'll be going over planting the Korean natural farming way. So that's a lot of people dig a hole and stick a tree in the ground or stick a plant in the ground. Korean natural farming has a whole system of how to optimize that for maximal growth. Then the last one, and this actually is the starting point of all Korean natural farming, and I'm glad that I was preceded by the previous three, two teachers on talking about livestock. Because the pigs, the chickens, the cows, those are what kind of makes the farm. Korean natural farming exceeds any other system in livestock. Other systems you can hybridize, figure out some best ways, what works for you. This, the livestock, you're going to want to follow this to the T because it works 100% all the time. So um, here I'm teaching a level one course, which is an exposure to Korean natural farming. We do offer level two courses, which are hands-on, and you get to, we get to ensure competency in you so that when you go home, you feel competent, that you know you can make these recipes at home. And we also offer level three, which are advanced trainings. Um, so, who here, so the registration for certification, if you wanna get certified level one, you have to attend every one of these courses and then there's an administrative fee for us to file your paperwork and keep record of you. So some people already did that. It's $20 for members of our organization. It's $40 if you are not a member. So it is Chris DeWitt here. Okay, cool. Um, what about William DeBoe? Oh, yeah, what's up? We planted Let's Grow Hilo together. Yeah, good to see you, man. A long time ago. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Leo. Leo. Davina. Okay, and so those are the people that so far have registered for this. If you would like to get certified in Korean natural farming, you can still sign up today when you go home. 
I know, you know, it's obvious you've attended the first session <coughs> because no one else is probably going to go sign up for that now. Um, and then each time I'll check in to make sure you're here so that we can go through and make sure that process happens. It's important that you get all of it because you want to get the full exposure to this. So what I would like to do initially is introduce you to a few resources that I use to get my knowledge and where I share this knowledge. So this here, this guy right here, a small corner guy, little happy Asian guy, he's also a caricature on your handout, you can see him there. This guy's name is Han Kyu Cho. And actually in Korean you say it more like Joe. The Cho. So Mr. Mr. Cho. And we call this guy Master Cho because he has truly mastered Korean natural farming. He's taken a synthesis of um, a few teachers in his life and he synthesized this knowledge, especially around livestock. He is an absolute expert at livestock and he's put together a complete farming system. And what this book is right here in my hand is his theory and philosophy as well as an explanation of how some of the things work. So this book we have available. It's on our website, cgnf-hawaii.org. What CGNF stands for is Cho global natural farming. So Master Cho, he has a global network of natural farming dash Hawaii because that's our chapter here and our, our organization here that we've been running. So you can buy this on the website that we run. Uh, I am their secretary, so I end up doing most of the website and newsletter and those types of things. Um, you can join our organization if you'd like. Um, you get a bunch of discounts and you get updates on this and further support. There's a lot more resources that you can access once you're a member. The second book I have in my hand is his recipe book. So a lot of natural farming is similar to baking a cake. You cannot just take the flour and the eggs and the milk and throw it in your oven and expect a cake to come out. You gotta mix it, you gotta crack the eggs first, you gotta not put in the eggshell. There's a lot of precision to baking. This is as simple as it is to bake a cake. Has everyone here baked a cake? <laughs> then you can natural farm. <laughs> There's a lot of chemistry you can study into this. Yeah. So this book is its recipe book. This is like picking up, oh, how does he make this recipe, that recipe? A little bit of theory on it, um, but primarily, how do I bake the best cake? And of course, it's not a cake. You're going to bake fruit trees or something, or whatever you're growing. This here is Natural Farming Agricultural Materials. It's listed on our website as the Cho Recipe Book. It also has this name and title on it. And the website, one more time, also, Michelle, maybe I'll get a whiteboard. Eventually, I'll write some of this stuff down. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, put, I'll write that stuff down so it's a little easier for you. So, the next uh, question. So just like a recipe book, you can get, it'll say like, you know, coconut oil or something. And maybe here in Hawaii we have this brand. In your place you're going to have a different brand of coconut oil, right? And or if you, when you 
I really recommend you practice by the book first before you make any modifications. But eventually, maybe you don't have coconut oil in your region. And so you can be astute once you understand the full thing of the process to understand what oil you do have in your place. The other re rest of, or resource that I have that's, um, that's fairly popular these days is um, on YouTube. So, put this up here. Uh, let's pan over. And you can search for me on YouTube. Um, you can just search Drake on YouTube. That's my YouTube username. It's also um, something, whatever, how you get to a user's page slash. So, um, oh. website is our organization. This is a nonprofit organization that our mission is to maintain the integrity of Master Cho's teachings, to work with government relations, to spread education, <coughs> research, and promotion. So we do those things at CGNF. It's an official organization under Master Cho. This is my YouTube. I put a bunch of stuff on there. Um, and then I also run, this is my personal website, naturalfarminghawaii.net. Been running it since about 2008. Each day I get maybe 400 to 700 people checking it out from all over the globe. Um, it is, um, it really chrono chronologizes, <laughs> chronicles, <laughs> my journey learning this. I, I first went to Korea in 2009 to go visit Master Cho. I saw all this stuff happening there where guys are growing um, strawberries the size of your fist with no hole in the middle. It's a whole dense fruit. Each of those sells for like five dollars a piece to Macy's or the Korean equivalent of Macy's that they all chocolate dip and sell for like twenty dollars a piece. <laughs> so I saw this amazing stuff happening. Um, tomatoes, melons, cucumbers, um, strawberries, persimmon orchards, um, all, all kinds of stuff. And so I saw that in 2008 and I came back here and I started reverse engineering how they did it. Because Master Cho speaks Korean. I speak very little Korean. I can't even say I speak very little Korean in Korean. <laughs> <laughs> but he also speaks Japanese. So, Choto Nihongo Hanashimasu. Right, right. I speak a little Japanese. Yeah, Choto and Sitoshi, right? Chisai. Small. So, communicating with him. Also, this is Korean natural farming. It comes from an Eastern mindset. We here in America, well, are we in America? No. Here in Hawaii, no. <laughs> tend to think in a Western mindset much more sliced dice, much more having to know why than accepting this is how the master said you do it this way. 
So understanding how to translate not only language, but also mindset to teach. So I get paid by the state of Hawaii to teach sixth graders. I teach them agriculture. I teach them biology. I teach them chemistry. I teach them quantum physics. I teach them about the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> All these things you gotta know about. <laughs> so I've been able to take these concepts and I'll talk often in analogies. Where I'm talking about baking the cake. Gotta follow a recipe. It all makes sense to us, right? All of a sudden you see this farming stuff, you might think, oh, why well, don't I need to mix it? I can just throw it in the oven. Uh, you gotta mix it. Your cake is not going to come out right. So once you understand that, once you get your mindset into that you're cooking and there's some precision, you're gonna be fine. Because then you're not as often gonna want to cut corners. You know, you just don't omit certain things. So there are reasons we change recipes, right? But you gotta know how to make the right thing the first time, or learn with someone who can really help you out or you gotta already be a master in your own way to make these substitutions so what my goal is is to make this as simple as possible it really is easy I was talking with my mom last night and I was like my goal is to make it so much common sense you guys are like I already knew all that. Because <laughs> we already do know all of it. It's in our body. It's all around us. It's what nature is doing. This whole system works by just mimicking nature. I myself, I went and studied computer science. I was interested in artificial intelligence. I thought, oh, that's one of our pinnacles, right? Think of people really like, oh, I got all the way, went through all the schooling, got all the way to artificial intelligence. Turns out the most efficient algorithm, which is a computer program for finding the shortest path between a bunch of points, copies ants. Yeah. <laughs> ants will always find the shortest path. So we have all these complex mind ideas of how to solve this problem. The most efficient solution is to mimic an ant. As you travel a path, you drop a pheromone behind you. When you actually get the reward, you drop a stronger pheromone as you're coming back. If you didn't find a very efficient path, that pheromone is evaporating at a, con at a constant rate. And so the most efficient path gets the strongest amount of pheromones dropped on it and these other paths fade away. And they always will converge to the shortest path. Mm -hmm. So going studying all of this computer science stuff, computers thinking this, and the most efficient way to solve problems nature already figured out. So what this is, is biomimicry. We're studying what's already happening. How can we use that ourselves? So also, a lot of times we go out to our garden and we think, oh, this fungus is attacking me. I got to kill those MF bugs. <laughs> Fire ants. Yeah. And there's cases for that. Bugs are nature's janitor. The custodians of the earth. Why do you got bugs? They're trying to fix a problem. Why do we have fire ants? We've completely destroyed the fungal network of the earth and they're coming 
to get us to leave so they can fix it. <laughs> We're like, nah, I'm gonna kill them. <laughs> all kinds of bugs. Why are the bugs eating my plant? Well, why do you get sick? Your immune system's compromised. Luckily, we don't have too much bugs that try to eat us here. But around the world, you get sick, bugs will start eating you. So, what we teach here is how can I strengthen my system? Awesome. How can I make my immune system of nature, of this system I'm engaging in, as robust as possible so this fungus cannot get a foothold? So this bug doesn't even want to come. And so it's a shift in your mind of thinking, how can I be probiotic. Your kid is cranky. Whacking them probably isn't going to help. Feeding them, giving them a nap, those types of things are going to solve that problem. Same thing with our garden. Same thing with how we're addressing the earth. We go, we try to love, try to figure out what does it need. And our psychology is a little bit different. We've been kind of taken away from nature in the past couple hundred years. How many people ate, grew something and ate it today? You guys are good. You guys are good. This is like a rare group right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so getting I want to help you guys grow better so so any any questions so far just before I start the website on the whiteboard the top one is that a website or just a group name it was your nonprofit yeah it is a website it's CJ yeah the org you probably can't see from over there but there's this little rag up there alright yep this is a website. I didn't write www in front, but it's actually HTTPS because it's a secure site. Yes. Are you, would you say we're confident enough that <clears throat> this system to strengthen a rose apple to be strong enough to withstand the, the rose apple rush in like one of the rainiest parts of the island, or is that just taking too far? Yes. <laughs> yes, I am confident this system followed properly can eliminate any and all pathogenics, fungus, and those things. What this is about is about restoring balance. So I'll start with a simple analogy. A lot of times we come to land, and the land has some skin on it some grub, you know, bushes, all of it does, right? And we strip that skin off, and we sterilize it, and we make it clean. What happens to you if I rip all my skin off? Am I clean? No. <laughs> For like the first five seconds, it's real clean, right? Well, what starts happening immediately? Infection starts landing on me because I'm now exposed. They're taking away this layer. What else starts happening before infection? I start bleeding. When I start bleeding, then what happens? Scabs form. Is the scab nicer than the original skin? No. Are the weeds that we get when we rip the earth's thing away, are they nicer than the original plants? Kind of get some gnarly weeds going, right? So what do I need to do? Let it return. Right. <laughs> so you think you're ahead? Say I do rip my skin off. A 
bandage comes in the form of mulch but also restoring the microorganisms getting rid of that infection that probably got there it's all about microorganisms so when you're thinking about your land and you're thinking oh, I got some weeds or I got some infection coming in what you need to do Sorry, is to restore well. restore the skin <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we want to do we want to increase the microbes we want to put good microbes there and we want to feed them <coughs> so today what I want to start with is everyone has one of these handouts no. If you don't, there are some over here. You can also share with your neighbor, I guess we'll get more for your house. There's only two more. Oh, um, you got So you can share it with neighbor for now. Um, okay. Okay, so that's a good question. He was um, Steve Steve initially started by saying there's a lot of different ways to do natural farming. What I'm teaching here is CGNF level one from our organization. This is from Master Cho talking about this. The father, yeah. He's 83 years old. Um, go study with him in Korea. Um, and his son also has a natural farming <coughs> system. The Father's is like a symphony. It's very well composed music. It's orchestrated. The Sons is like Britney Spears, <laughs> bump and slap, let's make some money. Um, and it works to a certain degree, right? You can still dance to it. But is it nourishing you on all your levels and this I believe his teachings here truly nourish you on all levels furthermore the recipe we're gonna make today is right here and I'm drinking it his son's recipes I would not drink. Mm. If I'm going to be eating the plants, I want them to have stuff that's edible. Everything we work with in natural farming is edible. There are certain things we don't recommend eating, but you can. <laughs> So what I am going to do is, you notice on this, there is one slide up here, and there's another slide down here with three different things. First, we're going to start up here at the top, because this is the basis, fundamental, bottom line of natural farming. And the other thing, if you learn natural farming, is you'll find we have a lot of TLAs. Anyone know what that is? 
Oh, right up front. Someone might have been in the military. Three letter acronyms. Oh, yeah. Right? TLAs. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a recursive joke, though. <laughs> so, what we do is this vocabulary comes from Korea. A lot of the names of things talk about how they are made. What I've been translating to Western idea is how they're used. Because you make them once, and then you use them all the time. So calling them by their usage kind of helps us a whole lot. So let's quickly look at the top one here. And it says, I'm going to talk about its usage, which is this reason. And the first one is medicine. <laughs> We all need medicine, even plants. The next one is food. Only a few of us need food, right? Probably sometimes. Now we all need food, right? Every day. Well, not. I mean, you don't like within reason. Go with me. I know people like we fast and stuff, right? We like food. <laughs> we're nice to our neighbors when we're full of food. And the last one is a stimulator. How many people drank tea or coffee this morning? Right? <coughs> How many people drank brown rice vinegar this morning? <laughs> that was two of us. <laughs> Have you guys heard of drinking apple cider vinegar in the morning? <laughs> so we're going to talk about that's the reason this is in here. So, um, so the first thing we have here on this recipe, and this is, what I call this thing is the plant maintenance solution formula. So what this means is your plants need maintenance. Everything needs maintenance. Everything needs to eat once in a while. This is the formula. This is the most general formula to get everything you need for your plant. So, um, it's composed of these three things, and there is a ratio that you apply them. So, I'll write the first one up here. And usually, this is not the first handout I give to people. So, but since this class, I I figured this was the most fundamental place to start with this series. That's why it just says OHN on it because there is no meaning for that. So what this stands for is Oriental Herbal Nutrient, OHN. What I would like to do as I am talking about this is to pass it around. What this is, is a medicine that can be used anytime. Unlike certain medicines, you do not build up resistance to this. Anytime you use it, it's good for you. If you feel like sickness, scratchy throat coming on, you can use this, and hopefully within a few hours, it will go away. So what I'm going to do is just pass this around like this. You can take the thing, take a few drops. <laughs> Should have brought another syringe and had it go here on the other way too.
Yeah. 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 And is that what you're drinking? Dilute? Oh, this is pretty concentrated. Brown sugar. Brown sugar and brown sugar, yeah. That's what it's going to be. Sweet. Great. What kind of herb? That's a good question. What kind of herb is it? Oh, a tiny herb. So, this is oriental herbal nutrient. So, these herbs come from the orient. These, right? Got to be plain and simple. Oh, yeah. So anybody up front, can you tell me, do you taste? I'll give you a hint to start. It's composed of five herbs. Some cabbage family. Garlic? Well, we got a winner. Garlic. Liquid. We got a winner, liquorish. Oh, but you already know. Okay, we got a freebie coming from the back. <laughs> what is that? Our kid. Ginger. <laughs> so we took care of our easy ones. What else we got? Two more. Did you already know? You didn't taste it yet. Did you? Who's this? You already tasted it? No. You knew from behind. Okay, so we got another freebie. So someone who's tasted it, I want to see. <laughs> Cinnamon? Come over there. You Cinnamon? Taste? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, we got a winner. Cinnamon. <laughs> And what was the other one you brought up here? We can't see it over here. Okay, so I'll repeat it for everybody so we're all on the same page. I know it's getting exciting. We're all, we're all getting our, ta our senses engaged here. So the five herbs, to repeat one more time. Boy, for the blender. <laughs> So we got the five herbs. The first one, garlic. Second one is licorice. Third one is ginger. Fourth is angelica. And the fifth is cinnamon. Now there's a question up here to what variety because there are many varieties of angelica as well as cinnamon. And I should probably look it up to be exactly correct. But what I did was I recently brought back angelica, cinnamon, and licorice that are of the most superior quality. I brought back six kilos of it or something. And I almost, there's a whole story about how I went through custom. <laughs> I wrote down T on my declaration form though. And I had a whole duffel bag full of these herbs. And I was like, they, they Selected me out for like the strip search thing. I'm sure. I think it had something to do with my good looking one. <laughs> but they they selected me out and they went through and I'm like, I really like tea. <laughs> and they let it through. 
they had the agriculture inspector come. They're like, it's completely dry. You can bring this in. It's not a, you know, all this can be transported. So if you go source these elsewhere, the angelica, the cinnamon, and the licorice, uh, they'll be expensive, and you'll have to get them from further away. Right now, we're selling these for $10 through our organization's co-op. We give you the exact amount you need to make a half-gallon jar, which eventually renders about five gallons. So you will have plenty with starting with that. Garlic and ginger, you can both get these here. I recommend you get garlic from California if you can. The Chinese stuff is, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, but ginger, you know, get it from a reputable source locally. Really easy to get here. Does it have to be a special ginger? Any of the ginger family? Use the edible ginger, like the you know, yellow ginger that we eat. Yeah, it's not just like some random ginger that you just can't eat. These are all edible. Is it okay to have turmeric? Where did I buy it? No, where can you talk about it? So it's listed on our website, and then you can pick it up with no shipping at Sweet Cane Cafe in Hilo. So if you put in your so when you go to the form, make sure you type in a zip code that's on Hawaii Island, and it'll give you an option for no shipping. Can you use any of the other Chinese herbs? There's a bunch of them that are pretty weedy and easy to grow here. So this is the recipe as it's stated here. There is a big reason for all of these specifically and not to add in others. And there are other reasons for others, but don't mix those in here and call it OHN. This is your OHN recipe. This is the way to make it. You want to call it Drake's tincture thing? Cool. But this is OHN. So, garlic often known as anti-fungal, antibacterial. <coughs> if you're sick, you eat a clove of garlic, what happens? Your mouth gets real spicy. You're like, why did I just eat a clove of garlic? But you're probably going to get better. When you have it through OHN, it's fermented first. So the cells are open, and then it's tincture. So you're getting even more potent healing qualities of these ingredients. That's why it's so effective. As soon as you feel the cold symptoms coming on, use it, heals you up. Ginger, got a sore throat, ginger and honey tea. Cinnamon, super spicy. I like cinnamon. <laughs> cinnamon heats up your body, increases your digestion, metabolization. As we're applying other ingredients to our land, we want them to increase the plant's digestive capability. Angelica. I actually don't know too much about Angelica specifically, but it's sweet and it's really potent that helps this whole mixture go. I want to study more about Angelica. And if you'd like to know more about these, I highly recommend studying Chinese herbology or the oriental herbology to look further into it. And licorice is in, in, um, included because it is the harmonizer. harmonizer. Oh. Yeah, we actually got a super good herbal experience. It's actually good for the digestion. 
the common denominator of all of these is they're great for digestion. All of these. They all have other properties. The garlic, where I talked about how it's antifungal, or they often say antimicrobial, it's not true. It is antipathogenic microorganisms. It leaves the good guys alone. Oftentimes you'll hear things that are antibacterial. Natural things are usually not as antibacterial as they're advertised. They're antipathogenic. They're leaving the good bacteria behind. Synthetic things that you start using like bleach is antibacterial or antimicrobial, but it kills everything. Chlorine is super gnarly on the chemical level. It just blows things apart. But what happens when you blow whole things apart? Looters come in, opportunistic people. So if you blow your whole environment apart, kill all the good guys and the bad guys, who's going to come back first? The good guys or the bad guys? If I'm using something like garlic and I'm only killing the bad guys and leaving the good guys, who's coming back first? Good guys are going to get even more powerful, right? You wiped out the bad guys and they're like, finally, I love fun. Oh, yeah. Did everyone get a sample? You no. Guys? No. no. Okay, so we'll send more around. Drake, do you have scientific names for like the cinnamon? Do you know which cinnamon that is? Because there's different kinds of cinnamon. Yeah, the Latin names I do have. I don't have it in my mind right now. Um, sure. Yes. So is it the, the CG and F website that we would get the herbs from? Yes. Yeah. What are the And it's a screaming deal, for real. Like, I didn't even charge a smuggling fee. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is one of the main things we're adding into our maintenance solution. This is the first thing listed on your paper there. It is, again, the OHN. It is these five herbs that are put in there. The more you research into this, the more you'll find out there's a very specific reason it's these five. And they're actually put in a specific ratio that everything is one times, except for the angelica, <coughs> which is twice as much as the others. So these, I have one part garlic, one part licorice, one part angelica, one part cinnamon, and two parts, or excuse me, I might have said angelica, just not ginger, that's what I meant. One part cinnamon, two parts angelica. So there's a very specific ratio that they're even at, and this synergy really helps the plant. So they're all, they're all really one, 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 two. I miss a one. So they're in this ratio. So did anybody notice any effects while you were taking that tincture? It's delicious and it's smooth, right? Yeah. It's like salad dressing. Yep. You should try the thing I'm drinking up here. Um, so you may notice if you take it in a little larger quantity that your, although your throat down to your stomach will start to heat up, and you'll get a little warmer. It's increasing your digestion. It's working with your whole body. Because it's, it's fermented and then tinctured, it goes immediately into your cells. 
alcohol is it transported directly across the cell wall. So it has immediate effect. You don't have to wait for a, a capsule to dissolve in your stomach. It's immediately into your body. Same with the plants. It goes immediately into the plants. So you don't have to wait for some pesticide or whatever. It's boom, it's happening. So any further questions on OHN or as a medicine? Did you say that we have to add the garlic and the ginger or it's already in what we are So we sell the dry herbs, the, the three dry herbs, garlic, or no, excuse me, not garlic and not ginger, the rest we sell. So you said the garlic needs to be fermented, how do you do that? Um, I'll go through that process, yeah. Um, I want to I wanna get through this first before I get into the details of how things are made. Because once you have this broad overview, you have a target to aim for, and then you can learn how to make things. So I wanted to let you know what it's constituted from so that you know what it is. Um, but the actual making it is a little... A lot, so well, that's why you have six classes in the series. <laughs> and you got half the room drink that stuff, half the room that's in it. That's something. <laughs> Pretty good. Trust. So they talk about walking in faith, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I know someone who has uh, problems digesting things, diverticulosis, and that person cannot eat anything fermented. But would that person be able to eat this formula that aids in digestion, or no? Uh, I would be extremely careful in that case. That sounds like a rare symptom. I, I, I talk. I often talk about human health and fixing digestive problems because many of us in today's world have digestive problems. So I talk about that specifically sometimes. Um, but I, I would use extreme caution if you have an already known uh, symptom. Yeah, I thought I was thinking, do you not use some bulk beer to ferment those down? And if so, uh, somebody can see me at me about to Yes. It's, yeah, it's, um, fermentation process changes a lot of those things. Um, yeah. Okay, so next I'm going to move on to the next one here, which is our food. Because it's important that we have food. So this has a TLA and it is Fermented plant juice. So, like I said, a lot of our recipes refer to how it's made. You ferment plant material to get juice. Pretty straightforward. But you gotta follow the certain recipe to get to it. Next time, we'll be going through a demo of that. <coughs> what? Fermented plant juice is, is, and I'm all waiting for something profound. It's food. It's, food. it's really simple, basic food. Also, if you read into Master Cho's literature, 
on one of the last lines, he says, it is the king of all medicines. I think it was Hippocrates that said, rock out, party hard. <laughs> Let thy food be thy medicine. And then, yeah, and thy medicine be thy food. And so this is along, along those lines of how can a food be medicine? And it is. All these different foods have different nutrient profiles, and they are out there. What we are trying to do in this case is just get food. Next time, I'll talk a little bit more about it and go more into depth of different types of food. Start with some poo-poos, then go to a main course and finish with a dessert. There's different types of foods, right? Different orders we eat them in. Same with these foods. We can make it from different things, make different things happen with foods. Essentially, this is the blood of a plant. So in me, a whole bunch of stuff, but part of it is the blood. The blood is probably the most nutritious part. Probably. So what this is, is an extract from plants that is the most nutritious part. So... And it's alive. What's that gap? CO2. Um, let's see, how should I set this around here? That's... Yeah, yeah. Oh. Awesome. Um, yeah, let's see. I'll do it this way. Uh, just that's the thing I was going to send around. Why do I do that? Um, Okay. So I made three different ones. I got banana flour. Um, if you can be careful with this, you can drip a little into your hand and sample it. No. <laughs> 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 We'll wait for the <laughs> So, <clears throat> any any questions on this so far? Everyone kind of understands the concept of different foods. We make these extracts. It's just the blood of the plant. It's not the rest of the plant. So, this in a certain essence is concentrated compost. You're going to take composts and decompose them to get nutrients back. This is a concentrate of that because do you really need the whole plant or did you really just need the nutrients it was aggregating? So does it matter what kind of plants you use to ferment? I mean, stuff that you have in your garden or weeds or... You know. Yep, it does. It's so the same like, is dessert different than the main course? Absolutely. Is that just banana flour? <clears throat> this one's actually um, unripe papaya. Do you sweeten your ferment? How do you ferment it? How do you go about that? Um, hang on one sec. 
Do I sweep my fermented taste? Do you grind it? Do you yeah. juice it? So what I'm doing is I'm grokking it in my head. Oh, next class I was going to go over this in excruciating detail. <laughs> so those of you who had tried it, what phenomenon do you notice is happening in your mouth right now? It's not sickeningly sweet as I thought it would be. You know, bananas. Sweet. More saliva? Like... Salivating. Yeah. That's the green papaya, right? Oh, this is the the sunlight yes. 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 <laughs> So when you're salivating, if I just had blood, it's going to get kind of gross pretty fast, right? <coughs> Unless I put it in the fridge. You know, when you go blood, they don't just like leave it out, right? <laughs> they put it in the fridge before they give it to the vampires. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so there is extra sugar added to this as a digestible and edible preservative. That keeps the blood from curdling. It keeps it so that when I later digest it, or when I later dilute it, it becomes a nutrient. Sugar is a small chain of gasoline. It's just a shorter chain. When the sugar's longer, you get gasoline. It's a hydrocarbon. It's a fuel. So it adds its energy later when I dilute it. Are you constantly adding sugar as a storing it? No, I'm super saturating it and then leaving it. Are you adding like sugar cane sugar or sugar cane dash? That is brown sugar. Can you use other things like honey or molasses or something else to it? Sugar cane? Brown sugar? Brown sugar. Brown sugar like C and H brown sugar or brown sugar like raw cane sugar? Either one will work. So, so what source do you use for brown sugar and why? I go to Hilo Rice Mill and I get 50 pound bags of brown sugar. Hilo Rice Mill. So what I want to do is go over the next part, which is our vinegar. <coughs> so our next thing up there is a stimulator, right? And we already discussed that it is really awesome to start your day with a glass of apple cider vinegar. Did you say coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes we use coffee because we're like jolting our adrenals. And it's kind of like constantly juicing your adrenals. Versus why we're kind of, we like warm things in the morning, but another reason we may be sluggish is that brown rice vinegar acts as a cleanser. So if you have a bunch of stuff stuck in you and you start your day by cleansing that out, you're then going to be more peppy. 
and that same energy boost, you may very well find that just a glass of brown rice vinegar, or if it's a little bit easier to get apple cider vinegar for your human health, but I'll talk about that, will help you out. Dilute it, put it in there. So <clears throat> I called it a stimulator. Why does it stimulate? Brown rice vinegar has a unique property to it that it flips from being alkaline, or excuse me, it flips from being acidic to being alkaline. So even though the vinegar itself is acidic, upon cell metabolization, it becomes alkaline or basic. Does ACV do the same thing? It does, okay. to a lesser degree. Okay. Brown rice vinegar has this unique property that it is one of the most potent of flipping you from being acidic to being alkaline. So if I'm a cell and I have a receptor and there's some stuff stuck there, and the cell is gonna be alkaline, and there's this thing here stuck to it. When it metabolizes and this cell receives brown rice vinegar, it flips the polarity. In fact, I may be doing that wrong. It may be negative. And then it, so if it's negative, it flips the polarity. When the polarity flips, this cell is then free. It's like a magnet flipping the poles. They're not going to want to stick. They're going to want to push away. Are, are you saying that it, it, you take this with the morning or whatever, that it flips the whole, your whole system becomes alkaline? Some people talk about having a two acidic system versus an alkaline system. Are you saying this helps with your digestive and stomach? You're getting it. You're on the right. You're on the right line of thinking here. Yeah. Is it going to flip your whole system? I don't know. Is it going to flip every cell that comes into contact with it? Most likely. So it flips this. So if this nutrient here was stuck somehow, stuck to this cell, now I'm a new nutrient coming in, and I have no place to anchor. It's like a dock. It's full of boats and no open spots. But I use that flipping the polarity with <coughs> metabolizing vinegar. Some of the boats leave. Now there's room for new boats to come in and unload. <coughs> so they can bring those nutrients into that new cell. So when you are applying this, you're applying it with a medicine and a food, and now you're going to give it this stimulator, polarity flipping, alkalizing system. And so those foods and medicine are now available to be even more metabolized by myself. So it's going to increase metabolization. I'm talking about, to be really clear about this, the question was I said um, brown rice, but then I was talking about apple cider vinegar. Many of us are already familiar with apple cider vinegar, using something we're already familiar with. That same familiarity, you're going to get even more potency if you use brown rice vinegar. Brown rice vinegar is a little bit harder to come by because we're not a rice culture here. However, what plant do we have that's very similar to rice? Someone said it over here. Bananas? Bananas. Think of a rice plant. It grows up this stalk, throws out this little head of grains. Think of a banana plant. Huge, grows up like this, throws out a little bit of grains. High starch, 
content and they turn into sugar swaps. Bananas are huge rice plants. <laughs> For us here, what we do is we change this into banana. And so my TLA for that is banana vinegar. Because BV was not a TLA. <laughs> banana vinegar. I will teach you next time how to go from making fermented plant juice, how to easily then make a vinegar. So you can make all this at home really easily. Master Cho says brown rice vinegar is really good. This is going to be your second best is out of bananas. Your third best is going to be apple cider vinegar. Is there ever a time where one would be better than the other? Uh, whichever one's cheaper, closer to you, um, those types of reasons. Oh, it doesn't? So has anyone ever used vinegar to clean their countertops? Yes. Right? Yes. Vinegar also is similar to how when I was talking about garlic, that it is antimicrobial. But it's not really antimicrobial, it's just anti the bad guys. Acetic acid will kill most bad microorganisms. Acetic acid is what vinegar is. Not all acetic vinegar is metabolized the same way in the system, but the, because when you make your own vinegar, there's all kinds of enzymes and other things in there besides just the acetic acid. What um, the white jugs of Heinz vinegar? is made from petroleum. <laughs> the brown jug right next to it that says apple cider vinegar, or read the label, is the white vinegar with caramel flavoring put into it. Apple cider flavored this big. <laughs> you can, yeah, if you're a student, you see that? Those? Our cleaning products. <laughs> what we're talking about here is a living vinegar. Something that has so much more in it. Can I ask you a question um, about the banana vinegar? Does it end up making a mother Soviet top? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Yep. So in that in that vein, the process of going vinegar usually takes three to six months to make. There is a patented process called the Monsanto process. <laughs> they can take alcohol and turn it into vinegar in about 12 hours, maybe about 6 to 12 hours. Mm. Okay. Okay. So I, so I that like vinegar ground meat. If I made this vinegar and stopped using that, would it do the same thing? Yeah, it would still kill. Yep. 
So you gotta check your acidity with a pH okay. strip and make sure you're in the same acidity range. Okay. Yep. Kombucha be uh, like this type of vinegar? Okay, so the question was, was would kombucha be like this vinegar? Kombucha does have acetic acid in it. It is not going to be on, I would say, brown rice vinegar, banana vinegar, apple cider vinegar, then a kombucha vinegar. Vinegar, in terms of effectiveness towards natural farming for the effects we're using it for. It tastes vinegary, but it is different in a lot of other ways. So, I'll spend a fair amount of time on this, but this is the core of natural farming. If you understand that we are using a food, a medicine, and a vinegar for these reasons, this, you can go into any system and start using this as a maintenance spray. It's, it's gonna hugely increase your plant's growth. Or, so let me, let me be really clear with that. Um, Brondo has what plants crave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give me the water from the toilet? Um, what this does is microbes out there, when you have healthy, good microbes, they're naturally producing the acetic acid. When you have a healthy system, um, they're naturally fermenting. That's what's happening in your soil. Fruit falls, leaves fall, they ferment, they go through a decomposition process. That's what's being uptaken back. Um, these herbs here are very synergistic with life. It's not often happening in a natural system, but this is 100% natural in its, um, it's not an artificial medicine. And you are simply enhancing the immune system versus trying to manipulate anything else. It's like when you're taking the medicine, you're raising yourself up to a plateau and staying at a higher than your normal rate. You're digesting better. You're having um, these killing out pathogens that may be present in you. And you're just generally getting healthier. So this is the core of what natural farming is. This is the main food. Yes? You said this primarily uses a spray. Yes. And we're gonna make this mixture up so and spray it out. So just using this, because all of this is compatible with nature, you're going to enhance your natural microbes. That's why I start with food. If you have a bunch of people that are rowdy and you bring a bunch of food in there. They're probably going to calm down and just eat the food. Like, you know, if there's a brawl and you bring food, you're like, oh, food's ready. It's like, who's going to keep fighting? It's like, oh, I'm going to go eat. <laughs> so in any system, just adding these foods is going to take what's naturally already out there microbially and get them to behave a little better and come back to their center and eat a little food, feel a little better. So that's why I started with this. This is the core. This forms the foundation of the next part, which... So how are you guys doing? I'm going to go for about 15 more minutes before we get up and move around. Is that cool with everybody? Yeah. I know you're all, you guys are way more patient than my sixth graders. <laughs> So that is up here, this, this maintenance formula. It says here to combine in this ratio where the 
I've actually made this exceptionally easy to figure out these ratios. I've now written an app for Android and iPhone, and so I can go and pull up the app, and I can say to the app, well, hey, I want to make a four-gallon bucket of water. It calculates. It gives me all my dilution. I just released the iPhone version like two days ago, three days ago. It's actually a little better than the Android one, but I'll be working on all that. What's it called? It's called CGNF Solutions. So, Cho Global Natural Farming Solutions. CGNF Solutions, I'll write it down. So I made it super easy because it's a lot of times, you know, so it's <coughs> And the app is a little bit more complex than what I'm talking about today, but I figured I would start real simple, real easy, get everyone so they're like, all right, I got it. Can you move on? <laughs> Because once you're in that state, then you really got it. And when you practice it and you feel it and you go through it, you'll see it, it really works well. <coughs> so it says to combine in this ratio where the OHN, we're going to put 4 milliliters per gallon. The FPJ, we're going to put 8 milliliters per gallon. And the brown rice vinegar, we're going to match that at 8 milliliters per gallon. Just like a recipe, stay within these tolerances. If you think, oh, I'm gonna juice my plant and I'm gonna give it 20 milliliters, you're gonna run into problems. It turns out this formulation I'm giving you right here, the university did studies on nutrient absorption and there's graphs of like amount applied to amount absorbed and the graphs the right where they cross, right at the sweet spot, is right at these dilutions. And this took me a while to understand and to like fully trust that this is true, but it is. I've seen the scientific data on it. These dilutions are where you're at. Our culture is, if a little is good, a lot more is going to be a lot better. But that's not this case. Less <laughs> 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 on is not to be a moron. <laughs> These dilutions are the only alteration you would have is if your plant is sick or really weak. Do you eat more or less? Less. So if your plant is sick and it's already got some problems, go a little less. You don't want to, you know, you're sick, here, eat all this. Right? Now, oftentimes we see our plant sick and we want to put a whole bunch of stuff on it. Right? It's actually the opposite. Start feeding it small meals, nurse it back to help. It'll come back for you. There's, a, there's less in the, if you're talking about the dilution, or there's less if you're talking about the total amount of a standard dilution. So that's a good point. So she's asking less in terms of the dilution or less in terms of the volume that I'm actually spraying the, once I've mixed it. So what you want to do is less dilution because when you're sick, is it good to drink water or bad to drink water? Good to drink water. So you want to keep the volume the same because that's water. You're actually helping the plant, but less food in that water. 
how often. So, so I just want to make the point. This is stuff we already know. Yeah, I'm just kind of we we already know. Like, oh, when you're sick, you don't want to eat more, right? But when we come to plants, we think that we often think the other way. So I just want to, you know, I'm just making you think a little bit about how would I do it, you know? And plants are no different than us in a lot of ways. They're better meditators. <laughs> So how often was the next question? Here it says every 11 days. Oh jeez. Now, can you afford that? Depends what kind of plant you're spraying, right? Certain crops you might want to spray them every 11 days. <laughs> but is Steve going to go out to his orchard and spray every 11 days? You could do your whole way in. Maybe his does. interns might, right? Who's, who's on the intern crew? He actually does. Yeah. <laughs> and he has figured out systems to be able to do that. And so when you get these systems down, this is the recommended application rate. And look at these trees doing awesome. Why every 11 days? If you start observing a plant, you will notice it's putting out a new leaf almost every 11 days. Certain crops are different, right? It's a little bit different timetable. But for most uh, annual crops that we grow, kale, taro, sweet potato, it's going to put out a new leaf every 11 days on average. As it's starting to grow this way, that's when, as it grows a little bit, it needs a little food. It needs a little maintenance spray. So each plant is different. I'm giving you a really shotgun, but I'm also giving you the tools to know and the theory behind it. New growth needs some maintenance solution. Plants changing, time to apply some of this. Every 11 days is a pretty, if you did it every 11 days, you'd probably be happy with your results. If you are like Chris Trump, and you have 600 acres, the most important time to do it is right before flowering and right after it's done fruiting. I recommend about 25 gallons per acre and we'll see, I got the, I brought my power sprayer and we'll do a little bit of spraying. And I'll show you, you're just getting everything misted and wet. Underside of the leaves are where the plant digests the best, so if you can hit it under the leaves, all the better. Best time to do it is in the afternoon, evening time. As the sun's starting to set, it's a little cooler. Second best time is early in the morning. The worst time is when we're going to do it, right at noon. <laughs> Actually, and, and, and to, the, to put one before that, the best time is when you can do it. Yeah. I, yeah. We all have lives that we got to do. So, trying to tune in. Okay, so... That's the dilutions, that's our application rate. We'll actually do a bit of this. This last little bit here, let's see if I can do this. Okay, cool, I got six more minutes to get to this. So make my 15 minutes. Would you do all three of these in different containers the same day, or are you just? No. No, like are so, you just doing it, whatever the plant needs, if it needs medicine, do a medicine treatment? That's, that's a great question. So she asked, am I doing all three of these in different buckets? What I'm doing is all these at the same time in the same container because they're all synergistically working with each other. And that's one thing where I've noticed if you've had exposure to natural farming before, oftentimes you'll see one of these used in isolation. What I really want to give to you right now is they're used together. 
I just had a guy talking about his plants where he was applying fermented plant juice to his plant and he was growing a mold. And I'm like, did you include OHN and BRV? Because OHN inhibits mold growth mm -hmm. and BRV also inhibits that. We're not, we're not upsetting the pH, which those are, I don't usually like to talk in those terms because they're confusing and they're not necessarily relevant. But those are real cases. He was just using this alone mm. and he ran into some issues. So that's why I'm trying to really present this. This is a unit. And so up here I have my vinegar, I have my fermented plant juice, and I have my OHN right here. And so do I want to walk around my farm with all these jars? <laughs> Only when I'm teaching classes but do I have them isolated. So what I did, I'm going to drink the rest of this, <laughs> is I get a jar. On this jar, there's measurements here. What you'll notice is there's 200, 400, 600, and measurements in between those. On your paper there, there is a ratio. One, two, two. So pick some nice, easy unit for yourself. In this case, I'm going to choose 100 milliliters because my container will enable me to do that. And the first thing I'm going to do is pour into my jar 100 milliliters of OHM because I'm pouring in one of my unit. Right? So let's see if I can do this. One of the rules that I learned in computer science is never demonstrate anything. <laughs> So, there we go. I got my first unit in there, 100 milliliters. Now, I'm going to go on to my next thing, which is my fermented plant juice. And I'm going to pick the unranked pie here. How many milliliters am I going to add to this? 200. What number should I end up with? 300. You guys are smart. <laughs> Right. So I'm going to pour this in until I get up to 300. Now I got that mixed. Now I hope I got enough vinegar. I think I do. It's like 800 milliliter. So next, now I'm at 300. I want to add how many? Yeah. <laughs> See if I can look at it while I do it. And what number should I be at at the end? <coughs> yes. <laughs> now, look how easy my life is. <laughs> I now take this and I dilute it. 20 milliliters per gallon, because if you add 4 plus 8 plus 8, that equals 20, right? All these are in equal proportion. They're all in equal proportion on our thing. I just now have to add 20 milliliters of this per gallon, and I now have my maintenance solution. Other good thing about this, it, it is delicious. <laughs> Pretty soon you're going to be like, Throwing it in your stir fries and <laughs> making your kids drink it. Recording that's a farm for your belly. Hey, we need to go. Yeah, I got some other health spa stuff to go on. Um, How long can you keep that? This now stores for six months to a year. Refrigerator? You don't have to keep this in the fridge. It's all shelf stable at room temperature. If it's before mixed together, you can, is it also six months to a year for each of those ingredients? Even even longer. <laughs> yep, keep it out of the sun. Don't expose it to the sun. But now this is super easy. I've now got my maintenance solution. Now we 10 gallons. Mike, uh, anybody ever tried applying this to rapid OVA death? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It works. Yeah, I'm actually headed right after this to go. We're doing a trial right in Makuku Market. 
And so I'll, as we get that, yeah. So we did a we did a lesson here about a year ago. We got we got the project together. It's now funded. We got things going. Um, I don't know if I go on a side story. I'm gonna get off my time. I think I already am off my time, but um, you guys seem like you're into it. So, <laughs> so what is happening? What is rapid opiate death? Fungus. Right. We want to point at somebody and say, "This is a fungus. That's what's killing our forest." What is happening? We are ubiquitously burning hydrocarbons. Coal, gasoline, naphtha, methane, methane. When these hydrocarbons were buried deep in the ground, they acted as maximum security prisons for maybe a part per trillion of tritium or cesium or gnarly element number five. I don't know, sorry to tip on. <laughs> All these things, which were are just parts per trillion, right? Parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion. They're not really that big of a deal. When we are ubiquitously burning them everywhere, it's not so much about the carbon being released into the atmosphere, which is plant food. It's about that toxin that was safely bound under the earth and buried in some mountain. And when I dig it up, bring it to the surface, and burn it, now it's back in the air. And when it's back in there, now it lands on the ground. And now I'm a happy micro. And I'm working with this ohia tree. I send it nutrients, minerals. It sends me sugars from turning the sunlight into sugar. And we're happy. We're hanging out. I'm giving it all it needs. It gives me all it needs. It's happy. It's doing fine. Now, as a microbe in the soil, I now have a bunch of crap just call it for lack of a better term, that was in this hydrocarbon land on me. And for the first hundred years of burning fossil fuels and hydrocarbons, it wasn't that bad. But as we exponentially do it, first year there's two, then there's four, then there's 16, there's eight, then there's 16, there's 32, then there's 64, there's 128, 256, 512, 10, 24. And in five years, we went to now thousands where there was just parts before. And this exponential rate of as we're burning it, now I got exponentially more crap on me. And now I'm like, bro, Ohio, I gotta clean my house. I'm gonna be over here cleaning all those nutrients I'll send to you. Crap, I gotta clean this stuff up. I can't even survive and eat. And somehow this symbiotic relationship between the Ohia tree and me that we're so happy, I'm like, bro, I don't, I'll, I'll eat your sugar later, I'm just gonna clean the house. If I don't clean this stuff off my skin, I'm gonna die. I can't even worry about eating. I gotta get it clean first. All the microbes in the soil are being ubiquitously coated with this and they are breaking their partnerships with the tree. So now this tree that's there is like, oh, this other pathogen lands. It may be whatever sister, pick a name, lands. It's like, oh, there's nobody to guard this. There's all this wood here. It's The tree is stressed because I'm no longer feeding it nutrients. It's like, oh, look at all that opportunistic wood to eat. And it starts infecting it. Any and every pathogen that lands that gets a foothold in this stressed out environment kills your trees. It's happening in Pune. It's happening all over the world. Every forest is dying. It may be this fungus here that's the opportunistic. And if we think, oh, we got to go kill that fungus and use fungicide, we're only going to make it harder for those guys that have this partnership. They're not going to be like, I got this crap and that crap. What the? <laughs> the solution. Get those guys that were having that symbiotic relationship, make trillions of them, put them there, airdrop them some food. Now they got trillions of reinforcements. Hold the line. Oh, no problem. Right? We got ranks 10 deep. Right? We'll hold this line. Oh, we need food. No problem. Here's, here's a football of 
this stuff. <laughs> oh, that's just what I wanted. Oh, crap. Get medicine, get pain. <laughs> the kind, you know. <laughs> yeah. All these guys now got reinforcements and food. They're going to be like, oh, that crap there? Yeah, we just clean that up. You know, you got to move a junk car. Imagine trying to lift that by yourself. Imagine 100 guys come and try to lift that. Boom, it's gone. That's what we do. That's how we solve these problems. The same question about the rust on the tree, the same solution happening. Get trillions of good guys in that environment. Feed them well. These other problems, gone. I have a botanist friend who talks about, oh, the, the ohias are walking dead. You just don't know it yet. The whole island are here because of the invasive species which are there. But this is, how does this fit into your, uh, this is more junk on top of maybe more physical junk. You know, it takes the nutrients, takes or whatever, the invasive stuff around the ohias. It makes them weak. Uh, invasive stuff live in a different microbiome. As our microbiome dies, before just the Ohia wanted to be there because it was only these guys that sent nutrients and only these sugars and these things. Now I changed the biology. Now it's like, oh, myconia wants to sprout. Oh, this other thing that just, the environment becomes open to that. Majority of the things that are invasive are actually highly medicinal plants trying to fix the situation. It just got set back this much. Kohila is like crown jewel of the forest, old, slow growth strategy. The new stuff, all fast, whatever. It's healers trying to get the thing back. It's still a natural progression. If we do not intervene, this process could take thousands of years of going from we killed the, all the microbes to then having them slowly regenerate and whatever. But if I come in and I drop a trillion in there, but good guys, now that entire area is full. Because it could take a millennium from a microbe to go from there to over there. That's, that's light years for them to travel. Versus as a human, I can walk from here to there in like two seconds, maybe even less. I can carry a whole bunch of these good microbes. And so if we intervene and we help this system and we understand it on this fundamental level and we start to get the reinforcements and all the life there, no problem. The invasives will go away because the microbes that are feeding them are no longer there. It's like those guys got pushed out because we put the indigenous microbes back that changed the biology in the soil system that now the invasives don't want to be there. Just finished the lost language of plants, and that's exactly what they said. Those plants are calling <coughs> these other plants to them in order to disobey. Yeah, and there's all kinds of stress signals and smells and things that if you were really tuned in, you got these really powerful instruments, we just dull them out today. So the more you tune them in, the more you can actually hear and get in tune with these things. Okay. Are you actually foliar spraying the idea or drenching? It's a combination. <coughs> so the, you're treating it like a forest fire right now. Literally, there's a forest fire spreading. So you get your smoke jumpers out there. You build a fire line. You get, you know, your water. You protect the spots you need. You know, but on a one-on-one -on -one basis, how do we get up to the top of the idea with a spray? Little Mariyama unit. Oh, that's okay. nice. <laughs> okay. So you spray the whole thing. And it's especially effective to spray the soil around, get the get it into the microbes. That's where it's you know it's the most. But you gotta understand, it's not just the it's not just on the tree. It's the whole microbiome in the soil has been destroyed. So it's it's them cleaning house in the ground. It's not like oh it's just on the tree. It's this concept of cleaning house in our souls, reestablishing that depth of the good guys out there. Really important to be realistic though, too. Like you know, at least acknowledge humans. The situation because you know the invasives are a really serious, serious thing, you know, and they do take out the ideas, like they will overcome the ideas just like oak trees overcome oak trees. And they run. It's, it's just like a way, but people are so powerful, they can 
you know, they can affect the change to affect the idea for you to do so. Do so. And, and we often we often look at the surface, right? We look and we see, oh, I got to pull this weed. But if we look at the biological thing underneath, we can be more effective. So you're going to go pull, you know, rip the scab off, but then you're also going to put the ointment, right? We go, we pull invasive species. How often do we go and fix invasive microbiomes and think of the soil and think of that depth? Think of the trillions and trillions of life beneath the soil. Because we can't see it, right? It's an occult science, right? Is that what you're doing right now in this project? Like going and removing invasives and then spraying, or are you just spraying in areas where the be a The first thing I want to do is to get the reinforcements and the foods into the soil. Because if I'm pulling early and I'm yeah, I'm actually making the problem worse. It's like the thing hasn't had ointment yet, I'm ripping off the scab, it hasn't even started to grow skin underneath. So what you're saying is if you apply this plant to it more naturally, how much stuff you can plant to the Yep. And as you restore indigenous microorganisms and feed them. Yeah. They do most of the work. They're working 24-7. Yes. Trace them the desert. <laughs> okay, so, um, that's fun and exciting. Can I ask a question <laughs> about your solution? Eric, can I ask a question about your solution? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I know I took the, the sun's course, and, uh, so he said to add salt, you know, ocean water. Can you add it into that solution when you're spraying it, or and I know you'd have to use it right away. But so this this one I gave you right here, this like I said, this is a six series course. This is some of the most basic. Everyone everyone got it though, right? Everyone mm -hmm. today is like, damn, that's easy, right? And once we learn how to make these things at home, then it's even easier. Plus, it's fun. I work with kids. Someone was telling me the other day, um, you know, what do, what do you call a hemp seed oil spill? <laughs> Fertilizer. <laughs> so if, my, if kids are working with this and they spill it, it's good. It's good for the soil. It's not like you're working with some other thing where you spill it. You're like, oh no, call the hazmat. Yeah. Like, well, in some, if it's used too much, can it burn it? That is why we dilute to the proper dilutions. But Absolutely if correct. If it's too much, then it would be bad. Yeah, you're correct. So if you don't have plants yet and you're just turning your soil to start your farm, can you use that on the soil itself as opposed to foliar thing? Yes. This so is also a soil soils. drench as well. Drench. Where it says your application rate for trees is 25 gallons per acre, your soil drench becomes about 100 gallons per acre. The more you can drench this down, the deeper the microbes are going to go to find the nutrients. So, so the question is, can you use this not only for established plants, but can you use it for bare soil, like say you're starting the garden? Yes. We'll get further in detail into that more, but this acts as a food. You want an application rate about 100 gallons per acre, and you're really trying to get it in and at least soak the top half inch to an inch with water. Get it out there. Um, the more the merrier. Because we have so much rain right here, does that affect the amount of, of material that you're putting on? It, it affects it, yes. The, the rain, all environmental factors are going to affect this. you got to be a astute observer. Um, and I'll get more into that. Okay. Okay, so... I got this, we got that, we're, we're gonna be the less on, it's not to be a moron, we got that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, so don't, don't change the dilution ratios, you can change how frequently you spray. If you spray this every day, you're gonna get a plant that's like gargantuan size. 
but just don't change the dilutions. You know, imagine you had access to amazing good food, you'd probably be in your peak physical form. Right? We don't even know the potential of plants today. As we remove the toxins and let them grow to their full potential, they'll really amaze us at what they can do. So, uh, so, well, let's see here. You know, time eleven fifteen. All right. Sorry, I said I was gonna let you guys stand up and stuff. Probably stay here in the words. Already. So, um, so let's go. Let's go apply the maintenance for the solution. So, yes. Last question. My main one mention that all the solutions have to be in glass, except for the reader. Yep. Why? Um. So, so a question was on storage of solutions. Mine are all in glass. I prefer glass because it's easier to get here. Optimally, would be to store them in like clay vessels where it's kind of breathable. You notice I store them here with a sealed lid because I got in the car and I drove with them. And if they had a cloth lid, they might have sloshed around. But you'll see this one has a breathable cloth lid on it. When they're stored at home, that's how they're stored. So they're breathing. All of them. All of them except this one, except the one with the alcohol in it. All of them. And OH is the only one without Yes. <laughs> okay. So what we're gonna do? Um, Michelle. Yeah. There you got the five gallon bucket. Oh, you got a five gallon bucket with the water that we can use. Will that amount to make 25 gallons? Just <laughs> yes, 500 milliliters, 500 to 100 maybe 20 gallons. So this would be um, almost enough to treat a uh, acre. 25 gallons. Yeah. Yeah. 500. Really? Yeah. All right. If you know about the math, that I, I just wanted to be sure. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is approximately what you would need. And that cost for it all. Yep. To make those three bottles to be able to put in that bottle. Yep. Yep. So is that $4 worth of those three? Or is that $4 total to make all of that and make that? So is that actually... Um, I mean, rice wine vinegar, how much really is that? How much? And uh, you, you generated your own weekend, right? And your own projects. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the only cost is going to be the rice wine vinegar, really. Well, there's there's certain well, herbs that's right. Right. to make these herbs, and then there's some other stuff. So it must be $10 for your herb package. That's $30. But well, that makes five gallons, and then so you gotta, there's a whole yeah. bunch of amount. I got a sweet spreadsheet if you want to see. Yeah. Anyway, they're right now through their bag and they're ready and they're sold. Well, they're going to come back to them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yeah, they're back here if you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. Michael. So, definitely got the hardcore fans hanging out for the long haul, making it all happen. It's good. Um, so I know it's a lot kind of interesting as it comes through because it's uh, it may or may not be a different way of thinking. To me, it's kind of uh, um, you know, if you learn traditional agriculture. You actually may have a, um, have to to relearn a whole lot in, in with just a different fundamental mind space. So if we if we, everyone here is solid with the maintenance formula and you don't know what to do, do that. You look at your plant, you're like, I don't know what to do. Do the maintenance formula. But you notice on your piece of paper there are three more super basic formulas at the bottom. But if you look at it, you'll notice the majority of them we've already covered because they're almost a maintenance formula, maintenance solution, with three different new things added in. I also notice they're not all combined. They're in different blocks. So just like the maintenance solution that I made up this jar with, I could make up each of these three as a jar like this. Because I'm going to use them exclusively. I'm not going to use one and the other at the same time. I'm going to use them exclusively. So you could mix up three more jars. What I find is a bit easier is just to mix up this one and then to put these in. It's like, here's your salad. Here's your salad dressing. You know, I sometimes I want um, vinegar and um, what else do I put on there? Balsamic. Yeah, we you know we all got our favorite. I was gonna say ranch because it just came to me fast, but I was like, nah, it's not the right ranch, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I like to do is mix this up, and then I like to have my little additions that I add in, and I got three of them, and there's three of them because they're mutually exclusive. What these three stand for, the first TLA is fish amino acid. We're gonna go over this in way more depth later. So the main thing you wanna think of this is, what does it say it's useful for? Yeah. And it says DNA and fuel, right? Mm -hmm. This is fuel to your fire. When do you want to put gas on a fire? The correct answer is never. <laughs> when do you use lighter fluid when you're lighting your barbecue? In the beginning or once that thing's cranking, I got my steaks on or my veggie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use it in the beginning, right? I'm going to use it to get my thing started. This is fuel. You don't want to be throwing fuel on. Once your plant's growing nice and big, you don't want to be throwing a whole bunch of fuel on it. But in the beginning, to get the fire started, when the plant can't synthesize its own amino acids, use it in the beginning. So often in the beginning, you want your plants to grow leaves. Or you can think of it in a certain sense. It's true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or leaves with ownership. But you can think of this as meat. It's coming from fish. You want to put meat on the bones. That's what you're going to use. So if you look at your plant, it's all spindly, and you want to put some meat on the bones. That's when you're going to add this enhancement to your maintenance solution. It will get much more into the nutrient cycle later on. It will go, you need this as long until it reaches full grown hood. It doesn't want to put meat on its bones, right? Oftentimes, the thing was, don't we always want to put meat on its bones? Oftentimes in American farming, we grow obese plants. 
Is an obese person healthy? No. Is an obese plant healthy? Oftentimes we see we want to pump the nitrogen. Most people, when I talk to them about NPK or something, the only one they can remember is nitrogen because I don't think they remember which one the P or the K stands for. But nitrogen, people think plants got to get that nitrogen, right? We think if we over nitrify, we end up with obese plants that become susceptible to pests and disease. So we always want to put some heat on it, but not a whole lot. In the beginning, do you want a skinny baby or a fat powerlifting baby? <laughs> you want a kind of chunky baby in the beginning? We want kind of chunky plants in the beginning? Then we want to skinny them out. The next one on here is water-soluble calcium phosphate. This is made from bones. <coughs> Can you use eggshells and part of them? Okay. It's made from bones. So you want to put some meat on the bones, right? <laughs> so these two work in tandem with each other. One balances it one way to make it a little heavy. The other one goes in a growth spurt up. Heavy growth spurt up. And so between the sprays, you don't want to combine them both because the plant's going to go, oh, I didn't know what to do. You want to kind of lean your plant one way and then lean your plant the other way. And as you oscillate between these two applications, you will build structure as well as have a healthy plant the whole way up. And I'll go more into more detail on this, but that's just a preview of this. So the third thing is this is where we're going to use eggshells. This is made from eggshells. So what is an egg? It is the tooth of the chicken. Embryo. Right? And what is a fruit? Egg of the tree. Produce. Right? Chicken produces the egg. It's the fruit of the chicken. Fruit tree produces fruit. It's the egg of the tree. Right? These two are interlinked. So when my plant now has gone through, I've got I've oscillated it back and forth to get it up. So it had meat, bones, meat, bones. I built this nice structure. Now my plant's putting out fruit. Now I put water soluble calcium, this third solution on there. And that translates all of the meat and bones into a really nice fruit. So do you do that once the fruit is forming? All the flowers are on there? I'll go into like super big detail on this. But if you got the general concept, you can start to kind of get that going. Because there's this, this is, this is, some of the more advanced parts of natural farming. When I go study with Master Cho, he'll spend a couple hours talking about this right here because it's like I thought I knew and then I thought I knew and then I thought I knew and every time I learn more. And But with those general principles into your idea of thinking, okay, this one is meat. So you look at your plant, it's kind of scrawny, you throw some meat on it. Great. Your plant's too big. Two bugs are taking it. it. It needs structure. It needs something to harden it up. You put on some bones. My plant wants to reproduce. It wants to have, you know, more offspring. I put on the eggs. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We'll go through those. And so this is probably the most complex thing, but I just made it really simple, right? Mm -hmm. Try to keep it that way. I have a question if your fruit is like halfway formed, like say your avocados are halfway, then and I want them to be bigger, am I going to add the meat or should I add the eggshell? So if my avocados are fruiting, <laughs> am I going to add meat to the tree or no. bones to the tree? No. Or am I going to apply the fruiting formula to make my avocados fruit better? Mm -hmm. okay. But then can I put it too much on and it's going to drop off? Are you also including the maintenance solution with each of these? Yes. 
Well, that's, that's my question. If I was fruiting and I wasn't getting food and medicine and all these other things, I might abort my fruit. <laughs> but if I'm getting all these other things plus this enhancement of this fruiting, I want to hang on to that fruit and it's going to be so darn delicious. Blow your mind. Do we have time to talk about potassium or not? I'm not going to get into the chemical formulas right now. Um, I, the cool thing about this is that you can go reverse engineer all this. And it's kind of like I said, Eastern mindset, like just trust the master. It comes to Western slice dice, figure out there's something that we call this configuration of energy swirling in this vortex. <laughs> Potassium or phosphorus, right? But it's just a phenomenon. Potassium doesn't really exist. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, too often we get stuck in our models. The model is not the reality. So, be careful. Um, so, any further questions on these three um, additions? Yes? The fish amino acid, is that the same or different than fish emulsion? So it is, you, it is similar to fish emulsion. However, this is fish amino acid. This is made with the Korean natural farming methods. And this bottle is actually kept in my kitchen. And this stuff here, I am going to eat. And if you can eat your fish emulsion, then it's this stuff. If you cannot, then it is something different. <coughs> Is that the one that you, that you can buy at the store? Or did you make that? So this bottle here, I you I make it. We'll go over how to make it. But if you want to buy it, Jeremiah Hinton makes an organic certified product. His thing is now called Comical of Gold. He just branded his product Comical of Gold. It is top shelf, top quality stuff, all edible. I cook with it. Jeremiah Hinton. Okay, first. I'll write it up here. And is it just edible fish emulsion, or does it have to go Korean natural farming? It's Korean natural farming. And this is, this is you can search them up. Um, uh, oh. He's putting uh, some of the blue green algae in to that too, yeah? Makes a few different mixes. Okay. So know what you're getting, ask him for just the fish amino acid. Alright. Um, so we'll go over these um, two pieces for now in, in a lot of detail so and such and so forth. Um, any any other questions on this? What would you say about the possible <laughs> He's testing me. Um, I, I was just talking about not getting too stuck in our models. So a lot of times I'll talk to some scientist folk and I'll talk about how are the microbes going to get enough of trace nutrient X. Phosphorus, for example. When you start to think of this is an electron configuration swirling around this other thing, and even electrons are, are still models that we're thinking of. Yeah. Vibrations of energy yeah. happening. Yeah. I can go and I can go play a C and then a G and an F at the right instrument. Yeah. These are just harmonic waveforms in a certain note, in a certain octave. And the microbes are able to change the music that's playing. Yeah. So if you get stuck thinking, oh, I need C, it's like, well, then the microbes can't go from, with the same instrument, go from G to F to C. Yeah. So it's called transmutation. And I don't know how to do it, but they do. Yeah. So I just give them food. Let them hang out with me. 
<laughs> you do know how to do it, you just don't know that you know how to do it. Well, there have been no. studies done with chickens where they measured all the calcium they put into the chicken over its lifetime with the diet and all the calcium it produced with the eggs and, you know, the the chicken at the end of its life, they just they, you know, did all the burning and the thing with the, how much calcium came out. And, and chickens biologically transmute other things into calcium. So, yes, so you're saying chickens are transmuters of calcium? So get a chicken, ask it its secrets. <laughs> <laughs> what it will tell you is, hey, it's not me. It's the microbes in my gut. Increase my appendix, increase my intestines, and I will make even more calcium because I am giving my microbes a better home. That's why they write the first three days. Brown rice. Oh, the chickens. The raisin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. we get yeah. And I'll go over livestock. That'll be fun. Okay, so. Um, so let's burn some fossil fuels, right? No, so, so when I first started spraying, I was a, like a full-on hippie, um, freaking barefoot, didn't even drive a car for five years and stuff. And then I was flying in a jet craft to Korea and getting a single-use glass container as we're just like burning all this stuff. And I'm like, why am I living such a hard life when I can burn just less than a gallon of this and get so much more done productively for the earth like I'm talking about getting all the microbes out to the forest by just getting in my car and driving versus me carrying it or doing some crazy stuff like that <laughs> each of us is in a different place in our evolution along that line of where we go today I have a Maru Yamo tower spare <laughs> This thing is sweet. <laughs> Supported local business, even though I think it's Japanese. Oh man, sorry, I'm getting water all over. It's cool, I purchased it out after. Um, this thing, this setup right here, cost me about 850 bucks. Um, but it is saving me from all kinds of stuff. This thing, I can get whatever size container I want. So I often work with 55 gallon drums, I work with 30 gallon rubbish cans, I work with whatever, and I just hook this little guy up, it's a weed whacker engine with a pump on the front, and I fill up whatever my solution is, I put my maintenance solution in, add the enhancements for my plant as they're necessary, and then fire this guy up and just spray away. This thing will eat through about a gallon to two gallons per minute. So. Think of that, take that out to your, you know, you're gonna spray your orchard in like half hour versus if you're going pump and hand spray, it's gonna take you a while. Mm. Yeah. So think about the scale you're at, think about what you're doing. Steve was telling me too, even we can get his like 500 gallon super fire hose going. And so for him to do his property and to do it every 11 days, that's what his scale is. Each of us is gonna find a different space, but really, um, you know, think think about it, find out where you are in that spectrum of what you want to do. And for me, I was, I'm glad to be, um, you know, combining this with that because now I can go treat the whole forest for here. You know, this little rig here, four-wheel does, drive truck. Does Steve you do foliar only or for his maintenance, his maintenance kind of things for all these big plants? You don't drench the soil. He drenches it. He drenches. But he does them both. When he goes out and he sprays all these things, he's we foliar spraying and then you actually spray around the, the root system. Yeah, and his, he has a can and so he's able to just drip down from everything, like, you know, he's, he's hitting the whole deal. And so it's it's important that you can, you can feed the tree directly, but you also want to feed the microbes in the soil to build those up. As the more you feed your soil, the more it responds, the less you have to, like, soak the soil and you just feed your plant. Um, but in the beginning, it's always a good idea to, you know, to light it up. So, use what your Yeah. So we're gonna do this. I think I'll dilute it here for us right now, and we'll we'll get it going. So, you know, I got a volunteer. Don't all do it at once. That guy. Yeah. Okay. And so he's going to demonstrate to us how to put our maintenance solution in properly. 
And so what I use is this little shot glass for small stuff like this five gallon bucket. I also have this here for larger things when I'm doing like 55 gallon drums. So. Yeah. So, so we're going to dilute this properly. So here's your quiz from the wall. How many gallons are in that bucket? Five. Three. <laughs> it is a five gallon bucket. It is not to the brim. Next question. <laughs> Two and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half. Just try a three. So if you are going to add the maintenance solution in here properly, how much would you add? Fifty-five. Yes, someone's a genius, right? <laughs> so, uh, what's the answer? Fifty-five. Fifty-five. Three times twenty. So, yeah, you're right in the right window. So. Did you read how much is on here first? 30. Yep, yeah. so go, go for it. So he's going to add in 55 milliliters approximately into here. You want to be within a tolerance of like pretty darn close. Tolerance is pretty darn close. Yeah, larger volumes you work with, it becomes easier to get more precise. If you're trying to do just one gallon, it's extremely hard to measure out one millimeter, one milliliter. Mm -hmm. It just is. Diabetic syringe. Yeah, I mean, but then by that point, it's like, come on. Right. So um, make a little bit more and then just use it on the things you want and then just put the rest to where you're going to try to build soil. Dump the rest in your soil garden bed. Take it to the car. Yeah. I used to have a sprayer in the trunk of my car as I was driving down the road. I have an on-off switch. And I just put it in and spray microbes down the road. <laughs> So he now diluted this in here properly. If you look at it, it looks pretty darn homeopathic in terms of its dilution. So yep. huh. it's not much. It, um, it, it kind of looks like you've been drinking a lot of water and um, you just went to the bathroom for the first time today. <laughs> So it's not too much. You don't want to overfeed it. You might think, oh, I got to add a little bit more. But the way it works is it's just these micro doses. You're really trying to encourage the biology of the plant to grow and all this stuff. It's, um, you know, um, the micro, you're in, as you increase microbial activity, they will deliver more nutrients and stuff. You overload them. And also think about how tiny the microbes are. You need a microscope to see them. They're one micrometer in width. It's bacteria. Um, fungus can get up to like seven micrometers in width. So think about that. They, they need small things. So awesome. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Okay, so now we're going to go head out to Steve's lime trees and we're going to go spray those. But when we get out there, what we want to do is make a quick observation and look at them and see, do we want to just spray the maintenance spray or do we want to add some of these enhancements to it? So we're going to look at these trees and we're going to say, are they meaty? Are they needing bone structure? Are they fruiting? And we're going to make another decision on whether we should add another uh, enhancement to our maintenance solution. So with that, the lime trees are right next to that bamboo that way, and we'll go ahead over there.